It says this, and I fell at his feet to worship him. But he, the angel, said to me, see that you do not do that. I'm your fellow servant and your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Now, testimony of Jesus is a, uh, you know, the Old Testament, the tabernacle is called the tent of testimony. The whole concept of testimony uh, uh, goes all throughout the Old Testament. But in the book of Revelation, this phrase occurs three times, testimony of Jesus. It's the only place in the New Testament, four times in the book of Revelation. The testimony of Jesus, a lot of theologians get stumbled by it, but really it's very simply that. It's, it's Jesus. It's the story of Jesus upon your life, the encounter with Jesus, the impact of Jesus upon your life. And it says the testimony of Jesus, he says, who had the testimony of Jesus, worship God for the testimony of Jesus, get this man out, is the spirit of prophecy. Here's the amazing thing. When you're with Jesus, you're going to know stuff. The number one thing, and we forget this because in the church, particularly in charismatic circles, we, we exalt the gifts of the Spirit highly, which there's nothing wrong with that in a sense. We're to, we're to pursue spiritual gifts, especially that we would prophesy. But we understand that when you, when you pursue Jesus, see, when you pursue gifts, you can you can venture off into a religious side of Christianity. You, you may have the, the gift, but you forgot about the gift giver. Uh, a person who solely gives himself to follow Jesus Christ will get everything that they need in their entire life. Because Jesus is the very core. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when you experience something, you get understanding. I love the passage in Revelation chapter 3 where it says, you know, it's the one we typically use at altar calls where we say, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will open that door, I'll come in and sup and eat with, uh, eat with him and drink with him. And there's this invitation, like Jesus is on the outside of the door. Yes. If you open the door, I'll come in. And when Jesus comes in, it says in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, right after that verse, it says, and behold, a door was opened above me into the heavens, and the Lord is up there. So it's kind of like you invite him in, he invites you up. You invite him in, he invites you up. So you go up to that place and the Lord says, come on up. He says, come on up, literally. <laughs> come on up here that I might show you things that are come that you do not know of. And so I just tell people this just to remind them, look, all this stuff is fun. I love healing. I love prophetic. I love the gifts of the Spirit. I love church planning. I love all that stuff. But I love Jesus above everything else. And at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus. Everything's about Jesus. He is the love line. We've got to stay on that line. You keep your eyes focused. The Bible says, fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he, he, uh, he endured the cross. You were the joy set before him. This is amazing reciprocity going on. The Lord's eyes are fixed on you and your eyes are fixed on him. How could you lose with that? This relationship, there's a deeper place that God wants you to go. God wants to reveal things to you. God wants to help you understand your children, your grandchildren. God wants you to help, help you understand your, your pastor, your leaders, your overseers. I mean, there's so much mystery that's in the world. But in Jesus Christ, it's the spirit of prophecy. In other words, the revelation of the unknown comes in Jesus Christ. So we, we get a hunger for Jesus Christ. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I should have got into this more, but as I, as I mentioned earlier, hunger moves you. Hunger costs something. Hunger causes you to get up from where you are. So true hungry people begin to get up and say, you know what? I'm going to move toward Jesus. I'm going to see what Jesus is doing, and I'm going to do that. And typically, typically that may include an address. I mean, sometimes God gets you up. I mean, those of you who are here right now are hungry, I am sure. You came from Michigan. You came from Indiana. You came from wherever. You're coming here because there's some, I, I don't think it's just for fellowship. I don't think it's just for lunch. I'm sure lunch is very good, but it's not about lunch. It's not just to see what, what other people are doing or what other people think. There's a, a component of that. But you come here because you're ex hoping and expecting to have an encounter with God. Because when you have an encounter with God, all bets are off. Excuse the vernacular. All bets are off. Everything begins to open up because you encounter Jesus Christ. 
I mean, a few months ago, it was actually on, uh, I might have even told uh, Gary about this, but it, it was in uh, February of this year, and I could go, go on out with these stories because uh, I, I'm like, I want to go deep in encountering Jesus Christ. I want to understand the Lord. I need the Holy Spirit to do that. The Holy Spirit reveals the depths of Jesus Christ. It's repeated over and over in the New Testament. You need the Holy Spirit. You need God to know God, basically. And so as you pursue the Lord, what happened to me is on, on 2-9, I, I had a dream during the night. It was closer to the morning because I woke up out of the dream. And in that dream, uh, a lot of things happened that I did not understand. It, it's mystery. And, you know, last time I talked to you, I talked about uh, pray that you may interpret. God does mystery because he's a great, he's a great romantic of the universe. Mystery uh, is alluring, you know. And if you're not interested in mystery, you're never going to know the depths of God. You've got, to, you've got to be like Moses who turns to look at the burning bush because he doesn't understand it. And when he does that, a voice comes out of the bush. Take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And begins to speak to him his mandate. So somewhere in your life, you've got to turn. You've got to respond. You've got to be hungry. You've got to say, what is this? I want to understand this. I want to know the things of God. That hunger is that huge currency that opens up the depths of Jesus Christ. So on this night, I had this dream. I didn't understand it all, but I got up. I woke up, actually. When I woke up, I knew this was a dream from the Lord. I didn't know what it meant, but it's one of those moments where, like, I'd like to hang out there anyway. Yeah. And so I woke up. I actually prayed. I'm laying there in bed, 5.30 in the morning, and I said, Lord, could you allow me to re-enter that dream so I could finish it? You know, I want to know what else is going on in that dream. And as clear as a bell, the Lord spoke to me and said, "Just close. you don't have to re-enter the dream, just close your eyes. So I closed my eyes, and when I did, instantly he began to download information about all my children, like prophecies, words of knowledge, understanding. You invite him in, he invites you up. All this understanding comes into, into my mind, and so I get my phone, and I start, you know, I start writing it all down in my phone, you know, on my notes, I'm I'm going through all my children as I did these. And what, as I'm going through it, you know, when, it's kind of like prophesying. Have you ever prophesied ahead of your knowledge? Yeah, yeah you prophesy and realize, well, that was pretty good. <laughs> I, that didn't come out of me, man. I mean, that was amazing. It was amazing. You know, I, I got to write that down, you know. And I, I've actually, sometimes I preach where I said, just hold on a minute, talk among yourselves, and I write stuff down. I got to need to remember that for later on. That was powerful. That did not originate in me. That must be God, very powerful voice. So, so I'm writing these things down. And as I was writing them, uh, laughter came upon me in very powerful ways, like uncontrollable. The second time I got laughter, and of course my wife sitting, is laying next to me sleeping. And so uh, I tried the first time, I tried to muffle it. You know, I'm under the covers and I'm just laughing, you know, and I don't know why I'm laughing, but it feels so good. The joy of the Lord's your strength, you know, and I'm laughing. The second time it caught me off guard, I laughed and I woke her up and she said, what are you doing? I said, you know, I don't know why I talked in low tones, but like the presence of God's here. And she goes, oh, I can feel it. I mean, it was like, you know, and they show in those movies when UFOs go over a city and there's that kind of vibrating feel like, it was like that. That's the only way I can describe it. The Holy Spirit was hanging over our bed. I mean, it was just powerful. And uh, I'm getting all this stuff. But here's the, here's the main thing I wanted to talk about. In that moment, I, I entered into a realm that I've never experienced before, I don't think, in my life. I think I'd remember it if I did. But where I was in the enjoyment of heaven. And it shocked me. It shocked me how non-religious God is. <laughs> It shocked me how fun he is. It shocked me how joyful. It was almost like, and I don't say this out of disrespect. I don't know who this group is. I don't want to mess with anyone's head. But it was almost as if angels were joking back and forth. And I liked it. I thought, I like it here. This is going to be fun when I finally get up here, you know. It's just the presence of God. And I brought up a serious thing in my life in this, in this presence of joy. I brought up a serious thing in my life. It's this battle I fought last year contending for a certain uh, direction of a movement, of a, of a church movement. And I was contending for it. And I felt like during last year, I thought, you know, I'm doing the work of the Lord. I'm, you know, I'm fighting for justice, you know, and I'm... The Lord's got to be really excited about what I'm doing because I'm going to help straighten this thing out so we can get things on track, you know, and all that. But they didn't respond to what I said to them, <laughs> the group that I was talking to. <clears throat> and so the Lord showed me in an instant, and I remember this is in this enjoyment of heaven thing. The Lord showed me in an instant me laying on a railroad track and a train was coming. Now, you know, in the old movies, you know, you typically lay on a railroad track because you're trying to stop the train. 
They're going to see you. They're going to stop the train. Somewhere in this picture that I saw in the presence of God in my bed with my wife there beside me, I realized that the train was not going to stop. Somehow I just knew that. You know how they, those things happen. The train was not going to stop. So I jumped up really quick so I didn't get run over by the train. And the train blew by, which was, it was a picture of this movement. A movement that, that I thought that I need to lay on a track for in order to stop them so you could divert the track to go in a different direction. It blew by, and when it blew by, it blew my hair, you know. And I just thought, whoa, good thing I got off that track, you know. <laughs> and so I turned to the Lord in this moment, and I said, Lord, what did you think about all that? Me laying on the track and the train blowing by, you know. I thought, you know, Lord, you need to talk to these people and tell them when you lay on a track, you stop the train. Stuff that needs to be talked about. And here's what the Lord said, as clear as a bell. He said, I thought it was cute. <clears throat> now, I'm a... I'm an older man. Nothing is cute. <laughs> and I thought, cute? That's like, this kind of feels a little bit derogatory, you know? And I, I thought I was being like a hero. I thought I was really speaking up. I thought I was doing something that made, was making a difference, you know? And you thought it was cute. And I said, well, what would you think about what they did? The train blowing by. He said, I thought that was cute, too. I thought, Cute? Cute, and, and is that feeling of the angels laughing as the Lord's talking about that, and I'm thinking, it could be that my life is too serious. <laughs> if I want to prep for heaven, it could be that all of our imaginations and all the things, I mean, there's people, or it's the kingdom of God, it's a serious business, we, souls, we need to win. I get all that, but how are those souls going to be one? Are they going to be won by, by religious platitudes, religious strategies, relig or is it going to be won by the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ living inside a human being? The power of the gospel, the power of the word of God. Sometimes just simply sharing the word of God, it will turn someone around. I just recently talked to someone very close to me who was in uh, same-sex attraction their entire life, and a neighbor across the street uh, called them over to talk to them. They talked to them. They began weeping. This person that was in a same-sex attraction relationship and the person pro started prophesying from an evangelical church began prophesying over this person. And that seed went deep in this woman's heart and it was there for days. She was laughing hysterically. She was weeping. She was laughing. She was weeping. You know that thing that happens sometimes when God comes in close like that. They are totally transformed. That was six months ago six months ago, and the Lord backed them out of same-sex attraction, brought them into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They texted me just recently and said, I just want you to know I'm still on the rock and I'm never getting off. I mean, it's a powerful thing of God when, you, when the Holy Spirit shows up. When you encounter Jesus, everything changes. When you encounter Jesus, understanding comes upon your life. Wisdom comes upon your life. How to handle things. I mean, really, and I have nothing against strategy meetings. I think you need to have strategy meetings, but those strategy meetings need to be more about uh, a, a, a encouraging the presence of God than they do even about strategy. Some of our situations cannot be solved by human strategy. They can only be solved by the wisdom of the Spirit of God. The testimony of Jesus is the Spirit of prophecy. Do you want to understand what's coming? Do you want to understand what you need to do? You get the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is an encounter with Jesus Christ. So anyway, that morning in that bed, you know, my wife wakes up, we laugh. We're, we're writing all, I'm writing all this stuff out. I mean, we had such a powerful encounter of the Spirit of God. And, the, and the, in, the, in the dream that I had had, was there, there was a bouncing golf ball which I had no idea what that meant, but I knew it was an important part of the dream. And so I thought, well, that's really weird. What does that mean? So anyway, long story short, I get up, I get out of bed. I didn't really want to leave my bed because I thought I might leave the presence of God, you know, when I left the bed, but I had to get a shower. So I went in the shower and I said, Lord, come with me into the shower. I go in the shower, you know, and I'm standing there, water's coming down my head. And, and I heard the Lord in his humor. Now remember, this is the enjoyment of heaven. This, this is, I've experienced the joy of God before, but I didn't realize that there was a culture of it in heaven. That's why, now it makes sense that the, the three big parables, the trilogy parables of the lost, lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, all end with rejoicing. You know, when each one of those are found, there's great rejoicing. And then afterwards, Jesus says, every time a soul comes into the kingdom, all of heaven rejoices. Well, every minute of every day, a soul's coming into the kingdom. So that tells you heaven is one huge, uh, never-ending party. I think that's going to be the biggest thing that shock people when they show up in heaven. They're going to show up and like, oh, it's a lot louder than I thought. 
There's more dancing than I thought. There's more rejoicing than I thought. It's, it's more fun than I thought. I mean, I just think we may be blown back for the first thousand years just to get used to the culture. You know, to get, to get the deep lines out of our face from all the difficulty and challenge that's, that's been going on in our lives for decades and decades. It's like, I, I think in a moment you're going to say, I didn't realize it could be this easy and it could be this fun. I should have enjoyed my time on earth much more, you know. So anyway, I go into the, I go into the shower. The water's beat, beating down my face. And as clear as a bell, the Lord speaks to me again. He says, look, I'll give you everything that you want. So he qualified it. Everything you want that rhymes with old in the alphabet. Now, I turned 61, and so I joke with people, it's getting old. You know, I know it's really not that old, but anyway, I was joking about it. And so I've been saying that. So the Lord uses my joking, brings it in, and says everything that rhymes with old in the alphabet that begins, that ends with old in the alphabet, I'll give to you. And so I'm going through, okay, bold. Yeah, I can take that. Cold. I didn't understand cold because I live in Cleveland. I thought, yeah, well, I don't know if I want cold. I said, let's put that one aside unless there's something in it that I'm not understanding. I'll put that aside. And then it's so I go, let's see, I go fold. And I thought immediately of the church, the fold, the sheep fold. And then, of course, gold. I thought, okay, let's just meditate on that for a minute. Gold. <laughs> Gold, I like that one, Lord. And then, and then let's see, EFG, H, hold. I thought of my wife to having to hold. Uh, I mean, all this stuff is just coming lightning fast to me. Mold, which is shaping. It's been what I've been a coach, basically, my total, total uh, uh, adult life. Uh, what was the last one? I told no, mold. Uh, told and sold. There was eight of them, eight of them. So, and, and then the Lord said, and each of your children are marked by one of those. And instantly, I know which ones they were. My second daughter is a real estate person. She's doing really amazing, you know. Uh, I thought of sold. I thought, there you go. That's for Lauren. Lauren is sold, you know. It's going to have sold over her life. She's going to be sold out in everything that she does, you know. And, and each one got attached to it, even with my grandchildren. So I'm like, this is ridiculous. God is just, Lord, that's how you communicate this way with golf balls and with, with rhymes and the alphabet and Lord can it be this easy so I go downstairs I'm talking to my wife you know we're having breakfast and a prophetic friend of mine actually from Charlotte where's the Charlotte folks here yeah from Charlotte North Carolina called me Rob McMillan he said hey what are you doing I said well I'm getting ready to eat breakfast you know and I said uh, he said what's been going on I said well I had a dream last night he said what was the dream and I told him the dream and so when I got to the golf ball part he goes oh that's the nines and I said I didn't clue him quick. The nines. Like, is this like an easy thing to interpret? I don't get it. He goes, you know, the front nine and the back nine. Golf ball, front nine, back nine. He says the front nine is, is the uh, 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 fruit of the Spirit. The back nine is the gifts of the Spirit. I'm like, well, you're talking like you understand what this all means. And I, I still don't totally understand what it means. And so I'm carrying this around like the nines. The Lord's talking to me about the front nine, the back nine. I'm thinking, Lord... Are you really like this? You communicate in this way. Lord, I invite you in. You're inviting me up. You're going to show me the mysteries of the future. So I was out with a guy. Maybe you've heard of him. His name's Michael Koulianis. He was in Cleveland a few uh, months ago. We had a conference. He's Benny Hinn's, son, Benny Hinn's son-in-law. He's an amazing Holy Spirit guy. He's in his 40s. So I'm sitting at lunch with him, and I said, so well, he says, so what's been happening, lady? I said, well, uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you this. So he says, yeah, it's two nines equals 18. That's what Rob McMillan said. I said, okay, yeah, front nine, back nine equals 18. And when I said that, I repeated it. Two nines equal 18. And my wife's standing there, and she goes, wait, what's the date today? It was two nine eighteen. You know, so I'm like, Lord, how do you weave all these things together right now? It's kind of creeping me out right now. It's amazing, you know. So anyway, I'm over to Koulianis. I'm with Koulianis. I talked to him. He says, what, you know, what's happening? I go, well, I had this, I had this encounter with the Lord on two nine eighteen. And he said, well, tell me about it. I said, I had this dream. I told him about the dream. I said, there's a golf ball bouncing in the middle of this dream, and it went in the pool in the middle of our sanctuary. You know, and he goes, wow. I said, very interesting. I said, really? Now, the interesting thing is, Koulianis is a former pro golfer. So he said, this is like connecting with him. And he said, what do you think it meant? I said, well, a prophet called me and said, it means the two nines. It's the front nine and the back nine. He goes, whoa. I'm like, why does everyone understand this? And I don't understand. It was my dream. It's my dream, is my encounter. I want to understand it more. And he says, the two nines. He goes, let me show you something. He goes, Kenneth Copeland. You all know who Kenneth Copeland is. He said, he just texted me yesterday. And he said, this year is the year of the two nines that equal 18. 
He said, the front nine, the back nine. And I thought, I don't think I believe that. He said, let me show you the text. He turns his phone around, shows me the text. Kenneth Copeland had texted him yes, the day before that and talked about it. So I went home. I, you know, I am still, this is what we're four months later now. I'm still unpacking that dream. But here's the thing. When you encounter God, he can give you something in one encounter that you may be unpacking the rest of your life. One moment in the presence of the Lord can change everything. Now, David had all of his issues, but the Bible says in the book of Acts that he was a man after God's own heart. He had hunger. If you hunger after these things, the Bible says if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be satisfied. You will be filled. God's calling us during this conference, I believe, to stir hunger in our hearts. Now, how you do that, I'm not totally sure, especially if you're not hungry. I think you have to kind of uh, to begin to uh, step back from some things that are filling voids that should be filled only by the Lord. That's right. And I don't know what that is. But there's a stepping back to say, I desire to be hungry for the Lord. It's funny, when I was driving here today, I was reminded of a conference we had about two doors down in the Holiday Inn back in 1996, I think it was, called Catch the Fire. And... Uh, uh, I was speaking, a guy named John Arnott from Toronto was speaking, and somebody else, and I forget who it was. And uh, I was doing an afternoon session, kind of like this, you know, a medium-sized group of people. And uh, a guy comes up to me and introduces himself and says, hi. He said, I came here because I'm really hungry. And he said, this is, and this is 22 years ago. I came here because I'm really hungry. I said, really? I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Louisiana. I said, what's your name? He said, my name's Tommy Tenney. I said, Tommy Tinney, and I, I'd, I'd heard something about this, him being in a pulpit in Houston, Texas, in a very large church, and the Lord struck the pulpit, it was a plexiglass pulpit, struck it diagonally, broke it, and threw Tommy about 10 feet back, and when that happened, the entire church began to collapse on the floor, thousands of people began to collapse on the floor, and it went all day long, in fact, people, they had several services, people that had to leave because they had other obligations had to crawl to their cars. People who came in later on to the next service got out of their cars and couldn't walk and had to crawl into the service. Actually asked other people, what's going on? They said, just get in there any way you can because the Spirit of God's in there. You know? So I knew this story about Tommy Tenney. And so Tommy says he's coming to this conference at the Holiday Inn just a couple doors down from here because you know, he's hungry. And I said, well, you need to speak. I'm speaking in the next, sex, the next session take my session. He goes, no, 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 no. I, I came to hear you. I'd like to hear you. And I said, no, no, no. You've come all this way. You've got something you need to share. You take my session. He said, oh, okay. And so I come, you know, it was lunchtime. We go have lunch and everything. We come back. He comes in. He says, uh, do you know where I could plug in my bread machine? And I said, bread machine? I've done a lot of conferences in my life. And I've had a lot of strange speakers come to our conferences. No one's ever asked to be able to plug in their bread machine. I said, well, um, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bake bread. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, just plug right in over here, you know. So he went over, he plugged it in. He had the ingredients. He put it all in there. He gets it all going. It's one of those quick bake machines, you know. And then he got up, and he's just such, such a, I don't know if you ever heard him speak, but he's such a, he's a pretty humble guy. He's just a straightforward, humble guy. And he just says, you know what? I'm hungry, folks. That's why I'm here. I came up from Louisiana. I'm not speaking here today, but hey, they asked me to speak, and I'm just hungry. I'm hungry for the presence of God. And he started talking about the bread of his presence, the, the Old Testament referencing of bread, and it represented the presence of God. He said, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Now, while he's talking, the smell of bread is filling the room. Is that not one of the sweetest smells that you could ever smell? Maybe chocolate chip cookies is a close second, but bread is like right up there, man. When I when I eat, you know, even if you're you're gluten free, you go, man, that smells really good, man. I want some of that bread. And so anyway, this is, he knew how long that was going to be baking. He's preaching. He's talking about how hungry we need to be and hunger the presence of God, you know. And I'll never forget because this thing kind of when it finished, it a little bell went off, went ding like that. He said, the bread's ready. I mean, everyone's like, you know, these are, these are pretty spiritual, charismatic people out there. They didn't know he's baking bread. Some of them are probably out there like, I'm smelling bread. This is amazing. He's preaching on bread, and I can smell the bread. He goes over, he takes the bread out. It's hot. You know, he brings it over. He breaks it open. He says, is anyone hungry? This is all in the context of Jesus. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Were you there, Gary? 
It was amazing. There was probably two, 300 people there, and they rushed to the front. And they come up, and he was handing out bread to everyone. They were holding the bread, you know, like this is like bread from heaven, you know, because it kind of was. And he said, and it was this big partition wall behind him. And he said, you know what? This is the, it was like this one here. He says, this is the wailing wall for today. Go before the Lord and, and be fed of the Lord. And so these people are, they're so touched by this message and the smell of the bread. They take their bread. They run over the wall. We have hundreds of people stand up against the wall. I'll never forget because someone from another session came in. They looked and they thought, oh, what's going on in here? I said, what's the bread of his presence, you know? Oh, how did I miss this session? They were so excited about it. These people were being touched. They were being healed. They are being restored. They are falling out in the presence of God, you know. But why was it? It was because they had to be awakened to the hunger that they had deep inside. They had to create hunger in folks to say, I am hungry for the presence of God. When you're hungry for the presence of God, you will never be hungry again in the same way because he will fill you. He will fill you. But when he fills you, you say, I want more. He fills you again. You say, I want more. You can go as deep as you want in Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is going to take you. He's going to cause you. I, there's a lot of things I don't share publicly because people think it's a little bit strange, but let me just tell you this. He will take you deeper than you've ever been before. You will encounter the Lord. You will see things that you do not understand. You will get interpretation over time. God will reveal things. You will live in parables you're not even aware of until after they're open, and you'll say, over, and you'll say, wow, God was with me over these past two years I didn't even know he was here Jacob when he woke up in the middle of the night in that dream that he had at Bethel which I love that story because we're Bethel Cleveland it said and Jacob woke up and he said God was in this place and I did not know it I didn't even know it there's something of an awakening that comes upon Christians today where they're going to realize that God has actually been chasing them their whole lives I'll finish with this last thing and then we'll have a Q&A time there's something powerful about the romancing of God. The Lord wants to lure you in. He's like bass fishing. I mean, you know, he throws that lure in and brings it by you a few times, and you've got to be hungry to go after it. You know, a bass goes after it because they sense there's a flash or a movement in the water, and they go after it. Christians, the Lord sends lures in in front of us, and we're just like, well, if it's the Lord, he'll bring it closer <clears throat> rather than going after it, you know. There's this lure of the Spirit of God as He's reaching out. He's loving us. He's always wooing us. He's going after us. He cares for us. In fact, that's why the Pharisees were so confounded by the Lord Jesus because He came to seek and save the lost. They did not have a theology for that. They had a theology that you go after God and you hope to hear His voice, but He would never come after you. Why would He come after you? But Jesus comes to seek and to save the lost. And sure enough, with that parable of the, 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 the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, there's the pursuing power of the Lord, his hunger for you. And when that hunger is reciprocated with the people that said, I am hungry for you, he's the romantic God that woos you. In Song of Solomon, it says he skips through the hills and leaps upon the mountains coming to your house. It's a little scary, particularly for guys. I said, I don't know if I want a God skipping and leaping on his way to my house, you know. He's just, he's skipping, he comes up to the house, and then he, but, he, but like a gentleman, like a gentleman, he stands outside and he says, come out, come out wherever you are. Come out, my love. Remember, he says, for winter is past. The spring has come. I mean, he's wooing you out. It shows that, and you know, we, women especially love that, you know. Men are not too sure, but women love it. Women love it, you know, and it's this reconnection with the Lord. And, and there's, but there's also a different side of God. We sing this song now. I don't know if you guys sing it or not, but the uh, reckless love of God. Reckless love of God. I wish I had the words up here in front of me. Reckless love of God. There are actually people debating it on the Internet like, well, God's not reckless. Well, uh, it's a descriptive word about what the Lord is like. He's not a... He's not a uh, uh, a judge that is sleeping either, but Jesus uses that illustration to describe our relationship with God. So uh, these are just pictures. When I, when I hear that, I think this is a religious spirit that doesn't understand God at all. Because in it, it says, uh, what's the part that says, um, chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I mean, that is like the top hit of 2017 into 2018. When I hear that song, I mean, I'm like, there's something within me that wants my God to come after me and kick doors down. And he does. But you know what he does it for? 
He didn't do that with the, with the woman in Song of Solomon because there's this wooing relationship going on. But when you're desperate, if you've got children or you've got grandchildren and you hear them cry out, you're going to get to where they are. You're going to kick doors down. You're going to do whatever you need to do to get to where they are because you love them dearly. And I'm telling you, the Lord is after you right now. And the thing that triggers him coming after is desperation in your heart. When you cry out to the Lord, he comes after you. He'll kick the doors down. This story of a friend of mine years ago, his son had become wayward and uh, uh, he, he kind of disappeared for six or seven months. This friend of mine, he said, you know, I didn't know where he was. I didn't know what was going on. He was, he was making wrong choices in his life. He said, but one day I heard that he was actually in a drug house in a downtown of the major city that he lived in. And he said, I decided, you know what, I'm going after him. He said, I love my son. I'm going to go after him. He said, so this drug house was in a really difficult neighborhood, obviously. And he went down there, you know, and he's just a middle-aged guy. I mean, he's not a kung fu expert. He's just a middle-aged frumpy guy like I am, you know. And uh, uh, he went down there, and he goes up to this house. He'd heard his son was in there. He knocks on the door, and a couple guys answer the door and go, yeah. And they're high, high as, as high can be, as can be, you know. And he said, my son is here, and I've come to take him home. I said, your son's not here. Get out of here. And they close the door. This friend of mine kicks the front door in. Yeah. When a father is going after his son. And every time I sing that song, it comes back to me and I get emotional. I go, this is my friend, man. He loved his son so much that he went down to a place that he knew was very dangerous. He knew that he was taking his life in his own hands, but he's going after his son. This is an incredible picture of the love of God and the father heart of God on this Father's Day weekend. You know, So he kicks the door down, he goes in there and they're all freaking out. There's a whole bunch of kids in there. They're all taking drugs. There's stuff going on in every room. He goes into each room downstairs and he's walking over bodies and people that are everywhere taking drugs. You know, He gets in and he sees their stairs going up steps and so he goes up the steps. I mean, this is so dangerous. He goes up the steps. He starts opening the doors of the bedroom and every bedroom stuff was going on in all the bedrooms. And he, there was one bedroom left. He opened the door and his son was sitting there. His son was sitting there all alone with a computer on his lap. And he looked up and he saw his dad and he said, Dad? And his dad looked at him and said, Son, get your stuff, we're going home. And he was like, oh, okay. And they hadn't talked in like six or seven months. He gets up, they walk out on the landing looking down the steps and everyone in the house had gathered at the bottom of the steps. So he starts walking down the steps. They said, you're not leaving this house with your son. And my friend, this may not sound very Christian to you, but my friend said, look, if I have to kill you, I'm taking my son out of this house today. And they looked at him a minute and thought, this guy's crazy, man. They, they, they formed a little tunnel for him to get out. He walked out of that house with his son. His son, by the way, now is, is married, has children. He's doing great. My, that, my friend went and rescued his son. Now, for me, that was a, a, you know, when you have kids and you have grandkids, you kind of get that. You're like, I understand that. I would do that too. The, their life is way more important than my life. And when I sang that song last year, the first time I sang it, I was just a, I was just a puddle in the presence of God. I just thought, Lord Jesus, rescue me. Lord Jesus, I hunger for you. Lord Jesus, in times that I can't pursue you, I shall you pursue me. Lord, come after you. All you have to do is have that cry in your heart and it triggers something to draw nigh unto God. He will draw nigh unto you. All you have to do is lean into it. All you have to do is turn toward it. That is hunger in the kingdom of God is when you say, I need the Lord in my life. Let's all stand together if we could for a few moments and then we'll answer some questions if we, uh, if we get a chance here. Well, we may not. It's almost 1130 now. Here's the deal. If you're hungry before the Lord, I don't have any bread right now, but Jesus does. Should have brought some bread with me. Just hold your hands out with your palms up. Get in that hunger position. <laughs> My little grandson, I've got, I've got uh, three grandchildren and another one on the way. Maxwell is a little over a year old and he doesn't.